Hi everyone, Steve, the Amateur Historian here with you with another story video chronicling a certain event in time, another event from the Pacific Northwest predominantly. I've always appreciated videos about events that are potentially major events, crimes, disappearances, things of that nature that either flew completely under the radar for some reason or another they just didn't attract a lot of attention and then there's other stories that do attract a lot of attention but then in the aftermath kind of fade away and are forgotten and I feel like that latter concept applies to the video that I'm doing now which is the tragic disappearance abduction as it was and murder of Brooke Wilberger. Now this was a big, big story in the Pacific Northwest and Oregon. It was something that blew up into national news. There were billboards everywhere. This story was featured on America's uh, Most Wanted, I think seven, eight, nine times. It was huge when it happened, but if you talk to anybody now, even people that live in Oregon, a lot of people don't really know about this story. And to know it, you have to go back to 2004. Now, Brooke Wilberger was a 19-year-old college student at this time, only a couple months older than me. She was born in February of 85. I was born in November of 85. And she grew up, I think, mostly in kind of the Eugene area, kind of the southern edge of the Willamette Valley. And she was from a Mormon family and was attending Brigham Young University. It was this, uh, I believe she had just finished her freshman year at BYU and had come back to Oregon over the summer and she was actually staying in Corvallis, which is where Oregon State University is located. I actually, for some reason, thought she was an Oregon State student. Um, there were elements of the OSU um, environment that actually did kind of infiltrate and affect the story, which may be where all my confusion was, but she was actually a student at BYU in Utah. Uh, but it just come back to Oregon and she was helping her sister and her brother-in-law who were running an apartment complex called the Oak Park Apartments in kind of the southern edge of Corvallis. Actually only a couple of blocks from where uh, Oregon State plays football. And so it's May 24th, 2004. I'm only a week away from graduating high school and I still remember the story so well. And it's so interesting because when I looked back at the information, they'd actually solved the crime for what happened to Brooke Wilberger in a matter of a couple of months. But for some reason, the way I remember it, it feels like it took like four or five years before they figured it out. And it could be that it took that long to actually convict someone for it. Now, May 24th, 2004. Brooke is doing the rounds at the apartment complex. It's the morning and she was seen cleaning uh, lamp posts around the apartment complex. That's what she was last seen doing and reportedly when it came to be about lunchtime and she didn't show up all of a sudden uh, her sister 
and brother-in-law started getting concerned and when they went to the general area where she'd been working she was nowhere to be found her flip-flops were still there her purse her keys had all been left behind her car was still there there was nothing that suggested she left for a period of time i mean her flip-flops were still there she was barefoot so pretty quickly uh it was fairly obvious that something out of the norm had happened. They went back and checked her apartment unit. She wasn't there. She was just gone. And this story blew up super quick. What happened to Brooke Wilberger? She just was in Corvallis cleaning lampposts and the next thing you know, she's vanished. Nobody has any idea what happened. It becomes national news super quick. There's massive searches, some including hundreds of people scouring the areas all around Corvallis and within the town. I think the searches stretched all the way up to Portland, uh, stretching south, probably past Albany towards Eugene. Like this was a major search effort. And uh, there was a volunteer searches going on for like, uh, I wanna say almost two weeks. Like there was so much effort put into trying to find this woman. And they unfortunately uh, were ineffective. Uh, come June, she was still nowhere to be found. And there was a big twist in the case. And it was one of these things where everyone thought, this is it, it's over, we figured it out. So this grade A sick freak named Sung Koo Kim gets busted right around the time that Brooke Wilberger disappears. He's busted for breaking into a dorm at Oregon State University, which again is pretty much right up the street from the apartments that Brooke disappeared from. Uh, this guy, this uh, Sung Koo Kim guy, gets busted for breaking into a dorm and theft. And essentially what the guy was doing, and obviously had been doing for quite a while, was he was stealing panties from, uh, I don't think it was just college girls, I think it was from just whoever he could do it. Because when he was busted and they searched his home, they found like over a thousand pairs of women's panties that he had stolen. Like, this guy wasn't just a guy who apparently got his kick stealing from, this guy, this was like an obsession with this guy. Um, and in addition to that, they found like guns and ammunition on his property and on his computer, they found thousands of images depicting rape, abuse, mutilation. This guy was a grade A sicko. And almost immediately, he was kind of convicted in the eyes of the general public. You know, when someone this messed up comes out of the woodwork and he's busted for committing a crime blocks away from her book Brooke Wilberger disappears the police definitely consider the guy as at least a person of interest he was never officially named as a suspect and I remember it, it made total sense I remember rumors going around which I don't think were substantiated in any way that Kim had stolen panties from Brooke Wilberger's residence, which I assume would mean the apartment complex because that's where she was staying. Um, that seems to have just been a rumor. I don't think there's anything to validate that, but that was kind of came out of all this. And the people, you know, the general public figured this guy's sick, this guy's a sexual freak. He probably abducted her and killed her or something. And the, the public thought this is it, it's a wrap. And then it turned out that they were able to establish pretty quickly that this guy, screwed up though he was, he did get sentenced for this um, other stuff that he was doing. But uh, it was discovered fairly quickly that this guy wasn't the um, wasn't her abductor. However, it wasn't too much further on down the road that the name Joel Courtney, who was a guy in his early 40s, came uh, to the authorities' attention in the state of Oregon. He was located in New Mexico at this time. This is, you know, only a couple of months after Brooke disappeared. He gets arrested for the abduction and rape of a college girl down there. Now, it seemed pretty obvious that Brooke Wilberger had been abducted, whether she'd been sexually assaulted was unknown at the time. But 
this Joel Courtney guy caught the attention of the authorities pretty quick, especially after they found out that in May of 2004, when Brooke disappeared, Joel Courtney just happened to be in the Corvallis area. So the police began to focus in on Courtney as a suspect pretty quickly. And it was known that he had a green van, you know, all these freaks that abduct, you know, women, they always have these vans that they drive around in. And more than one witness said that there was a van identical to Courtney's van that had been driving around the vicinity of Corvallis and specifically in the area where Brooke had been and had disappeared. So things are getting worse and worse for this guy. He's apprehended down in New Mexico. He gets sentenced to 18 years for this abduction and rape of this girl down there. And the police are able to analyze his van. And this is, this is what really did him in is they found Brooke Wilberger's DNA in his van. So there, there was really no getting out of it. Even though Brooks hadn't even been found, it wasn't even known for certain whether she was dead or not, Courtney was deemed the suspect. And he was ultimately, by 2008, it took four years, he was extradited from New Mexico up to Oregon where he uh, had to face, it was, I think it was 19 different charges. Um, in the case of Brooke Wilberger, who again, even by this time, nobody knows where she is. Um, and the guy gave in pretty quickly in order to escape getting a death sentence, which he probably maybe would have gotten. I think the fact that she was still missing, who knows, but he took a plea deal, which included if he agreed to tell the authorities where he had put Brooke Wilberger's body, they would give him a life sentence with no possibility of parole. And therein, I mean, everything was pretty much determined. Brooke Wilberger was dead. And he led them, the authorities, to the site where he had ditched her remains, which for a while was uh, information that was kept from the public, but it was ultimately determined that she had been disposed of on an old abandoned logging road between um, these little tiny towns kind of going into the coastal mountains heading towards the Oregon coast. It was only like five, ten miles from Corvallis, so she actually wasn't, her remains weren't all that far away from where she'd been abducted. But it was in a place so desolate that the odds of her being found by accident or by chance were slim to none. So, you know, I guess what little closure that gives, I know that Brooke's family was really appreciative of the fact that they at least were able to figure out where she was. And in all that, you know, Courtney admitted his guilt. And he was actually being looked at as a possible serial killer at this time because there had been um, a few uh, college co-eds who had, um, I think, either been disappeared or had been killed and there were crimes that they didn't have a suspect for. So uh, this guy was, you know, another grade A scumbag. And essentially, on the day that Brooke disappeared, May 24th, 2004, Courtney had been just kind of perusing around Corvallis looking for a girl to grab. He'd already tried to grab two other uh, girls, two other uh, Oregon State students, and they managed to both get away. And then you think by the time he grabbed Brooke, it was still the morning. Like this guy woke up, was in his van, and just ready to kidnap someone. He was able to abduct Brooke at knife point, which is pretty brazen, and it's pretty surprising that nobody actually saw the abduction itself when you think she's at this apartment complex. There's all these people around, you know. It's surprising that nobody saw anything, but it's even more surprising that this guy would abduct someone in a situation like that. Even if he grabs her real quick, gets her in his van, and takes off, someone can ID your van. But... Unfortunately, the guy got lucky, and it seems nobody saw the actual abduction. He abducted her at knife point and bound her up in his van and took her out into the woods uh, somewhere, you know, somewhere maybe in the vicinity of where he ultimately um, got rid of her remains. But he actually kept her through the day and kept her overnight. And the next morning, he attempted to have sex with her, to rape her. And according to his account, which this just shows what a freaking son of a bitch, sick, sadist freak this guy was, he was stunned 
apparently, that Brooke actually fought back when he tried to rape her. Like, I don't know if he'd, he'd tried to sexually assault other women in the past and they all just went with it and he was just stunned that a woman would fight to protect herself. But he apparently got, he was either just so stunned by how hard she was fighting back or he was just angry that she had fought back. And after raping her, he beat and bludgeoned her to death. And he used this fact that she fought back when he tried to rape her as like the motive for him killing her. He said he wasn't planning on killing her initially, which I mean, believe what you want to believe. This guy abducts this woman at knife point, takes her out somewhere, is obviously planning on raping her. He's, he's raped other women. I, I don't know if I believe that this guy was planning on just raping and letting her go. I don't really believe that, but he implies that he didn't decide to actually kill her until she decided to fight back. Take that with a grain of salt. And that, so, you know, as the search went on, you know, it wasn't until, I believe, August 2004 that they ultimately discovered, you know, this Courtney guy and pretty much got the evidence that showed, yeah, he was the killer. And then it turned out, you know, May 24th, Brooks abducted by May 25th, she's gone. And it's so wild to think this was such a big national story. Like, I still remember the attention to it like it was yesterday. It was just so all of the sudden, and it's this girl that's back home to Oregon for the summer. You know, it's, it's, it just really captivated people and got everyone's attention. It was just so sudden. She was just gone. It was, you know, one of the biggest stories in the country in 2004. And now it's like nobody ever talks about it. Nobody ever thinks about it anymore. It's essentially this forgotten, horrendous murder that happened, you know, near Corvallis, only what, 50, 60 miles from where I'm standing right now. Um, so, you know, for something so horrible, she was only 19. She had just finished her first year of college. She obviously had plans for her future. She had three more years in front of her. She was apparently a very lively, outgoing person. Um, she probably had a pretty good, solid life ahead of her, and it was taken much too soon, like just about anybody who faces something as horrible as being abducted and murdered. So it's a story that deserves to be remembered and deserves to be thought on from time to time when we think about the sick weirdos that are out there in this world and when we think about how easy it is to just be living your life one moment and the next thing you know you've got a knife to your throat and you're wondering if you're going to live to see the next day. So, you know, I, I, I had, even I hadn't thought about it for a very long time and it popped into my head a few months back and I kind of started looking into it and I realized this is something that, you know, even if you don't really see it, you know, out on the internet or out in the world much anymore, if, you know, this simple little YouTube video I'm doing gets a little bit more attention back on the case as a reminder of this horrible, horrible thing that happened, you know, way back when then it's totally worth it. So I just wanted to come on here and do a video about this case that, you know, was hit pretty close to home and that I remember so well, you know, thinking this woman was only a couple months older than me. You know, while I'm finishing high school, she's having her life taken away. So, you know, it's enough to make you think. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed that little, well, I mean, you know, at least learning about the story. Hope you didn't enjoy it. But um, anyway, guys, till next time, remember the old stick. Remember to like, share, subscribe. Hit up my Patreon if you want to help me out, help uh, boost up my ability to go out and produce more content to bring to you guys. I'm still going to be doing simple videos like this from time to time, talking about stories, um, you know, things that I think are really important to talk about, things that happened maybe kind of in my general vicinity, but places that aren't really all that easy for me to get to right now. Of course, Patreon will help me be able to get closer to those places and all that stuff. If you want to help me out, Patreon is the best way to do it. Anyway, guys, all that said, till next time, this has been Steve, the Amateur Historian. Take care of yourself.